Hello everyone and good evening wherever you are also whatever time of day it is I know we're in different time zones so uh, wishing you um, a good day wherever uh, welcome to today's session with the Brunei Gallery and um, we're revisiting suspect objects exhibition with Bessel Hussain and um, with a couple of new guests Loki and Suhaima Manzur Khan my name is Amina Yakin. I'm a reader in Urdu and Postcolonial Studies at SOAS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Brunei Gallery, the Centre for Pakistan and the South Asia Institute. Um, and we're going to have a um, very, I, I hope, very exciting, intensive and um, passionate debate on um, from creatives. So it's uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but to kick us off, I'm going to start with introducing the three speakers and I'll then give a little bit of detail about uh, my research and how it connects with why we're here today to discuss um, the work that they do. And um, I will uh, begin by introducing the speakers in the order that they will be speaking in and the format will be that it'll be a Q&A conversation. I'll put out some questions to them, they'll respond, we'll do a sort of round robin of maybe three sets of questions, we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A box, I think Lucy's already put that in the chat function, and um, we will, the speakers will take the questions at the end. <clears throat> We're booked for an hour and we will the, the kind of formal format of the session will run for around 45 minutes before we go into the Q&A. Okay, so to begin with, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Suhaima Manzur Khan. She's an educator, writer and poet from Leeds, West Yorkshire. She graduated from SOAS with an MA in postcolonial studies. She is the author of the poetry collection Postcolonial Banter, co-author of the anthology A Fly Girl's Guide to University, Being a Woman of Colour at Cambridge and Other Institutions of Power and Elitism. And um, and cut from the same cloth, as well as host of the Breaking Binaries podcast. Her work is um, disrupting understandings of history, race, knowledge, and power, interrogating the political purpose of narratives about Muslims, migrants, gender, and violence. And um, she says that she is less interested in disproving the truth of such narratives and more interested in asking what systemic violence they exist to justify. Uh, she's, uh, she's also written widely for The Guardian, Independent, Al Jazeera, Galdem, and her poetry performances, if you haven't seen them, are phenomenal. I'm hoping that by the end of the session, we might be able to persuade her to, to kind of give us something as well. Um, and uh, she is currently a visiting research fellow at Queen Mary, and her poetry articles can be found on the university and school syllabi. So um, the, I mean, I feel as uh, none of the people that I have here with me today need an introduction, but I am doing these formal introductions. Uh, the other speaker for this evening is Loki. I'm um, delighted to welcome another SOAS graduate back. Loki is a British Iraqi rapper and activist. He graduated from SOAS with an MA in Near and Middle Eastern Studies. He entered the political scene in 2009 during the Stop the War protests against Operation Cast Lead in Gaza, uh, quickly establishing himself as a unique and uncompromising voice within UK hip hop. At the age of 24, he had recorded a fire in the booth for BBC One Extra that would go on to strike more than 5 million hits on YouTube. In the same year, he participated in a US speaking tour with the American academic Norman Finkelstein, his lyrics at the cutting edge of political debate. And um, we look forward to hearing more from him in the session. And uh, last but not least, the person who has uh, curated and organized and uh, led us to this session today is Faisal Hussain, who uh, who creates work that questions perceptions, undermines lazy stereotypes and highlights missing histories and overlooked facts. Whether in a gallery or a sign outside a kebab shop, his cross-disciplinary practice is often presented in varied environments to engage with diverse audiences. 
Using archive and personal memory as starting points, his work explores the representation and understanding of South Asian culture and identity through the media, government, communities, and individuals. His current exhibition, which you can see online, and is it is it sort of also possible to visit now in person, Vessel? Um, can't remember. Yeah. So uh, Suspect Objects, Suspect Subjects is on display at the Brunei Gallery and a number of other works are currently part of other exhibitions at Eastside Projects and the Icon Gallery in Birmingham. If you are in London, please do come along and visit and take a look. His art has allowed him to work with a variety of different universities and to speak internationally on questions of security, criminology, immigration, anti-racism, and cultural studies. He's also the director of True Form Projects, which provides a variety of benefits to communities by collecting oral histories, artifacts, and personal stories. So welcome to you all. And now you're going to have to listen to a little bit of what I do as well, just to so I can provide a preempt to this conversation. And I'm doing this because it came up in a conversation with Vessel as we were thinking about different ways of talking and and um, setting up conversations around the exhibition. And um, one of the things he said was, oh, um, I really connected with some of the work that you did on Muslim comedy. And I thought I'll just give you a little bit of detail on my research related to the genre of comedy and Muslim representation and the ways in which it can confront stereotyping. I'm bringing this up especially because this is a session with Muslim artists and we're discussing a diversity of practices and also because the artists present, I believe, have an element of irony in their work. Um, so this is my contribution to the conversation. I don't study them, but I have studied others and I'll be interested to hear what uh, they think about it as well. So there's really a shift of <clears throat> emphasis in um, what you might call the first generation of Muslim comics post 9-11, who very much carried the burden of representing their community in particular ways. And a more recent generation whose comedy has become broader and arguably more individualistic. So what you see in the generation of explicitly Muslim comedians that started to emerge after 2001 is what Peter Mori and I call in Framing Muslims, a kind of hyper-performativity, a self-conscious way of performing Muslimness that plays back. And among the Muslim comedians that rose to prominence at the time, Shazia Mirza was probably the best known. And her, at, and in those early days of her career, her stage costume was topped by an austere black hijab and her willingness to kind of squeeze humor out of uncomfortable topics confronted audience expectations head on. And, you know, her opening line, which used to be very stark, hello, I'm Shazia Mirza, at least that's what it says on my pilot's license. It was kind of delivered very deadpan. Um, and uh, there have been a, a lot of sort of things since and then, but what was being challenged was the idea that Muslim women are weak and voiceless, and there's potentially a double target, to both the racist naturalization of the host culture and the misogynistic naturalization of some conservative Islamic gender codes. And um, there's also, you know, later on, many, there's obviously been a lot of work since then. And I just wanted to, in Britain, a man like Mobin has come out before that, Nadia Manzur, Burkhoff and others. But I just want to shift my focus to North America and to think about Muslim comedy there, because, um, and one of the com comic troops I just want to draw, take us back to is the Allah Made Me Funny group, made up of three comedians from different backgrounds, because I think this feeds into the kind of Create, uh, confronting racism uh, conversation. Azhar Usman is Indian American, Muhammad Amir is Palestinian American, and Preacher Moss is African American. So they, they four represented kind of a variety of backgrounds that made up the Muslim diaspora in the United States and brought a different perspective to bear in their stand up routines. So Preacher Moss, Moss was quick to draw analogies between being Black in the United States and being Muslim. And they really, um, there, there's much more I can say about them, but I won't, I just want to sort of put that in the mix. And then there was the Canadian TV sitcom, Little Mosque on the Prairie, that also um, brought up sharp satire and how people recognize each other and um, the kind of middle-class aspirational values. But since then, 
since that worked, you know, the advent of streaming services allowing for a more global exchange of media content has resulted in Muslim comedy with a different focus and a broader set of interests that kind of capture the complexity of Muslim experience, what uh, is uh, referred to by Nabil Achebe and its accomplishments and failures, above all, its human frailty. So we see um, uh, the kind of Master of None by Aziz Ansari's Netflix show, Hassan Minhaj's Homecoming King and Rami Yusuf's Rami and Feelings. So um, I just want to kind of say that the subject matter chosen by these comedians and the way they address it takes us away from that indirect intention among some of the first generation post 9-11 comedians <clears throat> to normalize Islam and to emphasize that good Muslims could be good Americans too. Instead, these comedians tend to inter interrogate both those terms and the focus of their narratives is individual experience rather than dispelling Islamophobic misconceptions. And both Minhaj and Yusuf describe moving from a position of shame. Minhaj recalls that when his parents asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, he answered white to positions of pride in their identity. So in that respect, we might argue for these comedians as examples of <clears throat> what Shalina Jan Muhammad calls Generation M, young Muslims who approach their decisions through the lens of faith, but who are also comfortable with modern Western life. So, um, Finally, each comedian is very knowing with regard to his audience and incorporates this awareness into his act with different modes of address, what we might call inside and outside modes of address. Sometimes they seem to be <clears throat> addressing fellow Muslim or Asian Americans and their experiences, and at other times they poke fun at the assumed wokeness of the white liberal members of their audience and the knots they can tie themselves in trying to decide what the politically correct response to the humor is. So there's really, uh, you know, a lot more that can be said, but I'm not going to uh, go into more than that. I just wanted to put that out there in the mix to say that this is the kind of creative um, art that I've been in conversation in my work and in confronting stereotypes and thinking about how stereotypes work uh, within <clears throat> the, the kind of, um, context of Islamophobia. So from there, I'll, I'll jump into my conversation with the three artists that we have here. And Fessel, Suhaima, Loki, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kick off with just a question, a very simple question to ask you about your artistic practice. You know, what inspires you? the art form you engage with, why, you know, is it individual? Is it participatory? Is it community led? Um, just if you can give us a sense of, of what your art is about and what makes you tick, that would be uh, something to kind of kick us off. So starting with Suhaima, please. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks, Amina. Thanks, Faisal, for um, inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, yeah, so I think the question of what what, what am I doing? What's my art? Um, I started writing poetry when I was studying at university, and I think that is important in the way that I came to understand its power. So uh, when at the same time when I was writing my master's actually at SOAS, when I was writing my dissertation, um, I was writing about, you know, the way that Muslims are constructed um, and the way that our humanity is always conditional. And at the same time, I was applying for this National Poetry Slam. I wrote a poem for that. That was basically on the same themes. And I remember the day that the poem basically went viral. It got like two million views. And what I realized on that day was that, yeah, that, you know, maybe one or two people will read my dissertation and maybe like two million people have engaged with the same themes, the same questions in this form of like spoken oral uh, culture and poetry. So for me, that was like the beginning of realizing that the way, the way I see my poetry is that it's, it's many things, but I see it as like a process of translation oftentimes. And I think for me, that was also like, I was just like, I'm leaving academia because it was just like the, the power that art has to actually translate those ideas that I think often are just confined to the ivory tower and like very few people get to engage with them, but actually all of us deserve to understand them and all of us deserve to understand how they impact our lives. And what I saw in that, process of that poem going viral was that 
here are these ideas I've had the time to engage with. And then through the poem, I was able to kind of enter this, I guess, like a different process of knowledge production, where it was like, this is the knowledge I have about my life being a Muslim in this country, merged with these kind of whatever discourses that kind of an, allow me to analyze it in a different way. And that obviously resonated with people. So in that sense, like, I definitely see part of my art as, as translation, right? As like, maybe in two ways. So translation of like the, you know, our experiences as, as everyday people, uh, translating that into kind of a knowable form, like a poem as something that can be shared, something that people can, you know, distribute and, and say that we see ourselves in this, or like we, you know, we, this, this speaks to us. And at the same time, taking those kind of, those ideas that are often like packaged in very formal and unhelpful ways I, I feel in, in academic spaces and actually just like showing the, the relevance that they do have to our lives and actually what how how actually these things can be useful ways for us to um you know see see our experiences in different ways so I think there's that and I think also poetry at least I don't know spoken I, I feel like I definitely see like a distinction between written and spoken um forms of poetry and obviously like what is poetry is another question but I think there's something also about it that I feel is inherently disruptive and or at least inherently has the potential to be disruptive and I think that's also coming from the fact of you know uh you know my my family's background is in South Asia Pakistan and I think as along with many many other countries and places around the world there's rich oral histories right rich oral traditions of the the ways that you speak is actually also carrying with it a history, a genealogy, uh, uh, you know, it's carrying with it stories that, you know, through colonial forms of control and coercion have been disappeared. And so I think there's also something about poetry that it, it can't be captured in the same way as necessarily other forms of sharing knowledge or other forms of like sharing our experiences. And maybe I'm over amping it, but I do think there's like something inherently quite radical about how you can use um, the, the spoken word. Um, but I guess the other thing I just wanted to add was that, because I think first of all, we, we were chatting the other day about as well, you're like, what your inspirations and stuff, like what makes you want to, what makes you want to produce art? And I think, I was just thinking about it and I think, you know, to be honest, I don't really, I don't really see a distinction or, or, or a choice in it, like not in a weird way, but in the sense that because what I do when I'm performing in front of an audience, I, I was, you know, I was aware from day one that I'm being seen in the context in which I live. And I, and I, you know, sometimes I imagine it as like all these comic bubbles that pop up around me, right? And I know what all those comic bubbles contain. I know all of the stuff that is attached to this body that I am housed in. And I think I do not, I'm not interested in talking to, I'm not interested in disproving those things. And from the get-go, I was like, I'm not here to just sort of prove my humanity and disprove these things. But what I did become very interested in then was like, how did I, in a very selfish way, I suppose, like in a very like self, uh, you know, it came, it came very much from like, uh, how do I author my own story? How do I have the autonomy to say what I'm seeing uh, in a world where there are so many narratives in which I am, you know, used and mobilized my body, my persona, my identity, uh, are used to to justify all sorts of, you know, bizarre and structural violences. So that was, I think, honestly, on a very personal level, like that, that was always an impetus that was there. It was just like, okay, under the gazes of white supremacy, colonialism, Islamophobia, patriarchy, how do I write on, on, for myself on my own terms? Um, so, yeah, so I guess I see poetry as like, yeah, you know, in a, in a context that we live in where there are these many ideological narratives, obviously we, we see lots of them at the moment, um, but, you know, and, and a narrative as simple as Muslims are violent, right? Like that narrative, has very material uh, consequences, right? It, it's a narrative used to uphold a global security, military industrial complex. It's a narrative used to sell all sorts of policing and surveillance technologies. And so the power that we have, I, I believe as artists and as a poet and in particular with language is that you actually have the power to produce not just counter narratives, you produce counter narratives, but also to really um, divest from and reveal that what those narratives are doing and those material connections that they have and essentially yeah pr produce counterculture right that's that's what i think um, many of us are doing that we're producing counterculture and that isn't just um an artist that's an ideological to me that's an ideological act it's a very deliberate act and it has very material consequences when we're producing counterculture we're doing it to also say there is a different way that the world can be um and 
the, and, and that we refuse the, the, the material conditions actually that we're seeing. So it's not purely this like abstract, theoretical, poetic thing. It's also very much grounded in, we believe a different reality is possible. Um, and so, and, and I think, yeah, and that's the final thing I think is that this is about imagining other worlds. And I, I really feel that art is like, one of the, you know, under, under capitalist conditions, how often we, we're not allowed to think of anything outside of the realms of does this produce profit? And I think art, or, or, well, not all art, but sometimes the art that we're producing, especially if it's countercultural, is specifically about allowing people to engage in another imagining of the world. And I just, yeah, I think that that is what keeps me coming back, right? It's what keeps us making more, writing more, responding more, whatever it is, because that's just, I don't think the value of that is fully yeah recognized and i think we we all know when we engage with one another's art or we consume art in the world and i think sometimes that's that's not understood to be as powerful as it can be and just reframing one thing providing one new way of seeing or looking or reading something can be yeah incredibly disturbing and destabilizing to the the systems that we live in and i believe that that is the that's yeah that's what i find so exciting about it unmute myself. Thanks. Thanks, Suhema. That's a, a brilliant start. And um, there's so much there that I want to come back on. Uh, but I think you've mentioned counter narratives and translations, and it's a really nice lead in to asking Loki the same question to speak about your artistic practice. What inspires you? What's the art form you, you engage with and why? And if, if you know, like you'd just like to open up on that. If there's anything you want to pick up from Sohema, you know, feel free to do that as well. So firstly, um, I would like to say that throughout human history, when there have been the growth pushed from below, the direction of growth is always bottom up. There has been art created to work in tandem with that process. For me, I view two main functions of what I do in this specific context. It's to galvanize people and it's to historicize the events within which we live. The best art has always destabilized the assumptions of the society. It has always problematized what are seen as commonsensical notions at the time, exposed pious hypocrisies of that society and acted to not only interpret, but also translate yearnings for justice. When we think about the way that James Baldwin, for example, described uh, art, he viewed it in this way. The artist's role is to make the world more human. This is the demand that the artist makes of his or her society. The society inevitably and unfailingly always resists. The role of the artist is to make you respect the moment the baby is born above all other moments. And when we think about whether the work that we aim to produce is merely individual or about community, you can also look at one of the other great quotes from Baldwin when he said, your pain is trivial, except in so far as you can use it to connect with other people's pain. And as long as you can do that with your pain, you can be released from it. So there's several different functions for me. Um, on one side, there is the final push, which I hope leads to galvanizing numbers of people around specific political causes. There's the other side, which is historicizing the events. But at its seed, when I'm in the process of creating something, in many ways, I think it's about dealing with trauma. Um, you know that when uh, people experience trauma as children, it affects the brain's ability to produce serotonin. And serotonin is vital um, to regulate anxiety and panic. And at several points in my life, when I have felt unable to cope with what is happening around me, the one thing that has been able to calm me has been producing music out of it. And it's in that way that I have hoped to convert what is personal pain into collective power and push it forward into existing 
political moments. Uh, one of my favorite artists, who's a political artist, uh, Peter Kennard, he said, art can't change things on its own, but it can when it's allied with the political movement. And that's something that I've always been keenly aware of, that when we are making this art, which aims to sort of bring and juxtapose the criminal with the crime or the perpetrator and the victim, what comes out the other side of it in terms of mobilizing people is always the most important thing for me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Loki. That's um, wonderful to have um, such a um, intense interrogation of the role of the artist and to uh, hear about your connection with how you create your art and uh, what inspires you. Um, and that takes me to Faisal and we've um, spoken previously about the exhibition, but I think it would be, you know, really useful for us to hear about your artistic practice and what inspires you, the art form you engage with and why. So a kind of broader introduction than last time. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, firstly, Simon, and like you for, for, for coming. Um, so currently, really, I suppose, <clears throat> I'm really inspired by the potential for intervention um, to do with the longstanding kind of presumptions about who I am and where I'm from by using really anything that I can find visually. Um, so really the majority of the work is to do with reveling in the subversion and questioning and undermining the laziness in which I am described and people like me are described, um, which I feel has gone on for far too long, basically. Um, so in a way I, you know, my creative process is to do with trying to look at things or trying to look at racism or the, the construct of racism as a material for the work in the exhibition and to be able to really deconstruct it and then reconstruct it again to show its fallacies and its, um, well, essentially to undermine it. Um, and yeah, I think there's a, for me, there's, that's a lot to do with, like many of us, upbringing and wrestling with the idea of trying to belong trying to be, trying to be here, trying to understand really why, you know, why people are telling me that I don't belong. Um, and hopefully what it means to be able to respond to it and to, uh, to stake a claim by making marks, any marks, whatever those marks are, whether they are audible, whether they are visual um, and, and in whatever form they may, they may take essentially. Um, so it's peculiar because the work can be anything at the moment for me. I've kind of re-entered my practice after 10 years uh, with this exhibition. Um, and therefore it's about deciding what the best material is to tackle the particular question or the premise or the accusation that is being asserted within culture or within, within popular culture. Um, Obviously, most of that work is individual. It's, it's based around my personal response to that. Maybe a bit of wit, maybe a bit of, you know, maybe, that, you know, kind of adopting potentially a, the ability to laugh rather than cry. Um, because there's so much often to cry about. Um, and therefore, but also in the past, a lot of the work has actually come from speaking to people. It's come from collecting oral histories, or it's collect from, collected from the Uber driver, the taxi driver, who for five minutes I'll have that very intimate conversation with to do with actually what matters, to be able to kind of check myself in a way. Um, obviously, my long suffering family probably is part of that as well. But, um, but the work is now beginning i'm beginning to get a lot more critical i'm not i'm not um a postgraduate but i'm beginning to engage with academia in new ways because i'm beginning to 
the, the questions are beginning to lead in that, obviously that kind of direction to do with legislation, to do with why uh, laws are being changed, why um, uh, things like Trojan Horse and Project Champion occur within places like Birmingham. So uh, I'm beginning to consult with um, academics who are working in a variety of different areas now to try and be a lot more critical about the humorous or visual work that I'm making. And that's now taking me into the realm of counter-terrorism legislation and like reading really things that could be part of a comedy within legislation, but they're, but they're real. They're very, they're very real being, you know, kind of being used against, um, you know, uh, uh, people every day, um, sociology or criminology and obviously arts and artists. So, um, so my, my creativity is based now really around quite a few multiple things. Everything is kind of bubbling in a way around those things, because unfortunately I'm being, <laughs> people are coming at me in different, you know, people are coming at us in different directions. So there's a certain amount of understanding, I think that is important or maybe ways of exploring, um, uh, those kinds of subjects. Um, but I have to say. I've been quite lucky that in Birmingham, people, allies um, have come from different places, which I'm really grateful for. So um, there, there, there is support from a variety of different people who are going through similar things and also those that aren't. And I think for me, that, that leads to a certain kind of hopefulness also in trying to explore and dig deeper and hold my breath and go under a bit a bit further, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vessel. Um, so I, I just want to, um, th th there's a lot in what you've said that I would like to return to, and perhaps I'll, one of the things that I'll pick up is about that um, specificity of location of where you come from, and um, you know, it, it's also a race. <laughs> it's also one of those things that we say is a microaggression, right? If we talk about it in the sense of if you're a person of color and you keep repeatedly being asked where do you come from, I'm not asking it in that context. Obviously, I'm asking you in the context of where you're located, where your art is, and um, also how does that work. Um, really, um, I mean, so Haima, you are somebody who's traveled between London and um, Leeds, and you must have, and Cambridge, so you must have experienced a variety of different spaces and of an education environment as well, uh, which you said that you were going to do your practice rather than be in the ivory tower of education. So I'm really keen to find out more about that location. You know, how much does that, in, like what kind of access is there in the location that you're in? How possible is it for you to do the art that you want to do? You know, are we like, we're looking at a, um, at an ideology within the government with regards to arts and humanities subjects anyway, a, a kind of really a preservation of those for those who can afford it rather for those who don't have access to it. So how do you feel as an artist? I mean, because one of the other things I remember, Sohema, you said was that if, if I'd asked you about seeing Fessel's work or going to a gallery um, sort of some time ago, you wouldn't have felt that that was something you could participate in. Could you tell us why? Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good range of interesting questions that you asked there. I think that, yeah, I mean, so I grew up in like Leeds, between Bradford and Leeds, and um, yeah, I think, to be honest, like this on this question of art and like creativity and confronting racism, I don't think it was something that ever seemed intuitive to me. Like I didn't, I if you had come to me as a kid, as a teenager and been like, oh, why don't you write a poem to deal with racism? I'd just be like, that's obviously completely irrelevant. Um, and that maybe that's just me being like a belligerent child. But I think that what, I think the real reason for that is that 
you know, those connections are not, were not really present in the places that I was in. And I think that's a lot to do with, you know, the socioeconomics of diaspora communities in this country. And, um, but also more, more than that, that the, the ways in which we are creative and were creative were not seen as art and want to, were not taken seriously as forms of art. Um, and I think, you know, just thinking back to even school days and like the, the, the things that are really dismissed as like, kids just like messing about I think that is actually like that, that's the height of like imaginative creativity that is really just put like you know it's unproductive it's like you know a naughty whatever else so I think um it's interesting actually being back in Leeds now because what I am really noticing is that uh it's not just public services that are obviously um kind of rampantly filled with um the prevent agenda but if you, I mean, since I've been back, like the youth club that has wanted to work with me, the like local football club, the, you know, coffee morning that your mum might get invited to, like all these different library, gallery, whatever, they're all in different ways uh, connected to counter extremism funding that can be through like integration schemes, through community cohesion schemes, and through these very like inoffensive sounding, like building a stronger Britain together um, type of funds. And the reason I think this is really fascinating and if it linked to this question of art is that what does it mean for if you're a youth you, you're a young person you know if I was growing up now in Leeds this is what I keep thinking and I went to my local you know youth club and I I'm expressing you know in, in this moment my grievances about you know what's going on in Palestine and I'm talking about this I very very likely and as we've seen in the last week will be just be reported to prevent and I think the question of like art and creativity is directly connected to this because if, if children and if anybody but if children cannot express political opinions and cannot ask political questions and cannot um yeah cannot ask questions about the conditions in which they live then how what kind of art i mean is that there's not what's the purpose of art in a future like that what's the purpose of art in a world like that and i think um it's i i, I feel very frustrated by how serious this question is and i feel that it's not really seen as very serious and i think it actually goes in hand in hand with austerity right so what you have is the government has removed all the funding for public services for the, the kind of you know maybe that you know to be fair in what i'm saying i think when i was growing up there were a lot more things you could do as a young person there was a lot more clubs you could go to and, and stuff like that but now all that's gone and in its place everything that comes in its place is counter extremism and so you're just being um you're 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 able to engage only insofar as you are seen as a suspect and as insofar as you are seen as a problem to be solved and managed and you know in in this er in this area and where and where I grew up, obviously this is like largely a problem that affects Muslim kids, but kids kids of color and just kids in general, like you can't have a political opinion um, anymore, and you can't even ask questions. And I think this is also linked to the question of like how do we, if art is about imagining alternative futures, what we're being told or what we're telling young children now is that you can you must not imagine outside of the realms of like a very punitive world. Everything must be seen through the lens of um, risk management basically and the irony is that obviously through gutting public services you create the vulnerabilities that you then police you create the poverty that you then say is, is actually a risk uh, for radicalization and so I think that's something that um, is really central because when we're thinking about like when I'm thinking about art and making art here you know I want to I want to work with young kids I want to work with like local asylum seeking um, network but it turns out that all these things are actually linked in some way or another and, and being forced to essentially report back to the state. So I think that I'm just very troubled at the moment by the levels of surveillance that kind of are being normalized. And I think, what does that mean about the ways that we can produce art? Um, and I think to be honest, like as much as there are these regional differences and local differences, there also seems to be like an overwhelming push towards like this normative standardization of just ideological docility like that's all we're being pushed to right like you just have to have absolute ideological docility and and depoliticization and and so i think yeah the but yeah i say that but then there is also like there is hope and there is like exciting things as well but i think that that's my overwhelming just thought at the moment um yeah sorry that was a bit off track to the in initial question but it's when you when you when i think about leads right now that's just honestly that's what i feel okay no, no, thank you. That's a really rich answer. And uh, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of things there about the austerity agenda, the surveillance culture, the, the funding question that came up before as well. And when you're 
you know, uh, to what extent do you feel that you can practice the art in the environment that you want? Um, so you're saying the environments are quite strictly managed or um, sort of um, intervened in so that it doesn't make you feel uh, democracy is is kind of in place as it were and I suppose that that's a kind of nice um, point for me to jump into Loki and ask this question because it, it's connected to what Sahima is saying as well which is about um, about sort of using your art to make um, to take make a stand from about positions that you believe in I mean I, I think um, like I've, I've been living in the UK now for over 20 years and, and I think one of the kind of um, moments I will always remember is going on the um, anti-war uh, march against Iraq and, and what it meant, you know, as individuals, how it felt to not be listened to. Um, and I wonder, you know, to where you see that sort of politics now in the work that you do and you work in um you work with rap and hip-hop and there is um it, it's a particular genre there's uh, there is a dialogue in this genre but at the same time it's a dialogue in which um do you feel that this is a dialogue that can reach out to to people who are part of this austerity agenda or is it only you know to do you feel this is something that you do to connect with the young people that, or people in general on the terms that you want to connect with so just well well when I debated David Goodhart um, the well-known figure at policy exchange he remarked to me about how big fans his children were of my music. And I later saw an article where he said even his own children call him racist. So it's quite interesting that you can actually speak to, you know, the children of people in certain positions within society. But what Suhaim is talking about is a hierarchy of political subjectivity. Now, we can't forget that our society within the House of uh, the Parliament, it has far more lords by a long way than elected members of parliament. You've got representatives of the Church of England, um, over 20, you've got um, a thousand laws that the monarchy was seen through the Privy Council to have vetted before being passed. And obviously it was 300 years that people in this country who are not landed gentry had to mobilize, be killed, be exiled, be sent to penal colonies around the world in order to vote for some form of parliamentary representation. So we're talking about the limitations of our political system. And like I say, a hierarchy of political subjectivity in a context where, you know, the war on terror, which you spoke about just now, you know, we're looking at a war that has lasted longer than World War I and World War II put together. There's no conscription, but we've all, taken part in what is essentially financial conscription. You've seen an average of 46 bombs dropped per day, and it's displaced 37 million people. That decision, which was taken against the will of a large proportion of the society, necessitated to some extent a death of civil liberties. We see habeas corpus suspended in specific cases. We also see the Magna Carta, you know, this great icon or Britishness, supposedly, according to David Cameron and others like him, as he wrote uh, a few years back, rendered meaningless. You could have a child sitting in a British school today learning about the importance of the Magna Carta to them, but simultaneously it's not inconceivable that they could have a relative who is detained indefinitely without access to the evidence held against them and without being judged by a jury of their peers and that child themselves could be questioned by police without the knowledge of their parents simply for wearing a Palestine badge maybe or for even using the word eco-terrorist in class. These are all um, real examples. And on top of it, you've seen obviously the Guantanamo situation where WikiLeaks um, revealed that the youngest child det uh, detained there 
Um, initially, he was 13 years old uh, at the beginning of the time in which he was detained at Guantanamo Bay. So it's a loss of rights. It's a transfer of funds. It's an allocation of public funds towards the security sector. But as Suhaima made clear, it's buttressed upon a racism. But this racism is not familiar to our age you know biological determinism is not what we're talking about perhaps we're talking about scriptural or or cultural determinism but it's not wrapped up in aesthetics in the same way but the the mechanisms which surveil and police these people who are racialized in specific ways is invisible through the extent to which it's ubiquitous in the society. And all of that is based on threat inflation. You know, according to Major Chris Hunter, specialist in terrorism for the British government, your chances of being anywhere near an act of political violence in this country is one in 16 million. You know, according to Baroness Wasi of the Conservative Party, one tenth of 1% of Muslims in this country have had anything to do with political violence. Dr. Frank Harvey puts it this way, you're four times more likely to be struck by lightning. So the society overall is being had for this suspension of civil liberties and on top of it, this, um, as I said, transfer of funds towards the security sector, which is largely uh, run by private companies, outsourced to private companies. So all in all, um, quite an, uh, uh, an unhappy situation. Thanks. Thanks, Loki. I think uh, you've really um, touched on, on the matter that is um, something we need to talk about is the freedom of speech agenda that is kind of going um, live as we speak and what it means for us with the work, for all of you, for the work that you do and um, student lives and politics. You know, how do you like, is it possible to mix art and politics and without being sort of put under the cosh as it were or from a certain age and and is it just to further a particular agenda that we've seen being repeated over and over again and it's interesting you mentioned David Goodhart you know people like that are quite chilling in terms of that they become the authorities on ideas of multiculturalism in this country and what multiculturalism means to David Goodhart is not uh, you know what I would um, think should be the the thinking about on policy but that is unfortunately where we are. And how do we change that those kinds of um, policies and those kinds of structures, those, those stru things that create, recreate those structural inequalities? Uh, so I'm really glad his, his children are listening to you. And, <laughs> and the other thing I, I suppose I was thinking about in this kind of ideological construction of, of particular uh, sort of I suppose pasts and histories and, and the way one is asked to be British, which is also what, what you said, which is becomes a kind of exclusivist narrative. And I'm thinking of the latest, which is that Boris Johnson, who's closing down all the arts, is, is writing a book on Shakespeare, right? So that's fascinating. And I know that Loki, you work with Akala, and I know that he does a lot of work on Shakespeare as well. And I'd be really in, you know, um, uh, excited to know how much funding he's getting from from the government for the kind of work that he does that really is you know about uh, art that is connected to transformative change amongst uh, young communities and um, the way that racism has affected um, black communities and people of color and how to kind of bring about change so in in a sense that kind of takes me to Fessel as well with regards to to your work Fessel and how much kind of um do you feel this art when you make it where can it go where can you go with it do you feel that there is a um you know how British do you feel when you do this art, is the question. Um, I don't, well, Birmingham is really all that I've known pretty much all my life. So that's my reference point to how British I am and how British maybe other people uh, think that I'm not. Um, so 
the responses of the work is always to that environment in different ways. It's one of the largest cities. It has a great amount of Pakistani diaspora, Muslim diaspora, probably one of the largest in Europe. Um, and so therefore it's inspired me, but then also conspired against me, just like the state does in a way sometimes. Um, but just picking up on what kind of both, both people have said, both Saima and Loki have said, is that this kind of preemptive environment this kind of preemption of crime, very much, you know, very science fictional, very minority report kind of um, kind of uh, environment where thought crimes are kind of now being sought out um, means that there is obviously going to have to be some form of resilience when it comes to trying to describe without seeming paranoid about the way these, you know, these futures are being colonized. And that for me is underpinned by things like Project Champion that happened here in Birmingham when 200 spy cameras were set up in a largely Muslim area of Birmingham and then dismantled in 2008 in Washwood Heath in Spark Brook, which were hidden. Uh, Three million pounds worth of government funds earmarked for tackling terrorism based around that. That's 2008. Um, um, and then they were taken back off for another cost of, I think, £600,000. So the kind of current climate, I suppose, is a revisiting of, of those kinds of things. This is partly why the piece of work Project Champion in the exhibition is there. Um, but then, you know, the, the biggest kind of Trojan horse, the Trojan horse affair, that I think has been the mother of a lot of what has gone on, where how many children lost their education? How many people? I think it was 400. Yeah, 400, 400 ch children lost their education over a rumour. These rumours that are kind of started by letters, these weird and wonderful letters that appear from nowhere that then decimate kind of communities. It's farcical, really. And this is why it becomes the material, obviously, for the work. Um, but then there are... I think, and still only last year, the Trojan Horse play that was toured um, by Lung Theatre, which involved uh, Dr. John Homewood. Dr. John Homewood went um, through almost three or 400 hours, uh, sorry, 200 hours of interviews um, to do with the school, to do with parents, to do with um, children about the trauma that they had gone through. Um, 90 witnesses, he stood against the, um, uh, the uh, I think it was the National College of Teaching. Um, so these kinds of, I suppose, cases um, need to be um, obviously challenged, but as the narrative changes to, for instance, accusing lawyers and those that are uh, defending civil rights as activist lawyers, the shifts in the discourse are where potentially art is a third way in the same way that we can describe who we are. The interventional power of art, just as Loki and Saima have said, I think will have a much more resonance. And I think people know about that. The government also understands that. And therefore, I, I see, I think there is this kind of systematic, almost, you know, kind of attack um, on, on, on those areas where we can potentially at least, you know, speak um, freely. So, um, yeah, that's... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I've said before, I'm pretty, pretty much still confident that by um, hopefully um, collective knowledge or collecting more knowledge um, uh, and working together, interventions can still be made. But I think this is why I think things like this forum are really important, which is why I asked to do it. Thanks. Thanks, Bessel. Um, I think a question I'd, I'd sort of like to um, pick up from what you've said there about the importance also of dialogue and connections. And that's something I've had to spend a lot of time uh, thinking about in this project that we um, that I did with Peter and Muslims, Trust and Cultural Dialogue. And, and really, you know, trust is an endpoint that one gets to after you've got the dialogue in place. But when you have so many obstacles to the way dialogue um, can be um, held, you know, in say where people do not feel safe, or in the way that Suhaim has described, and uh, you're describing in Bradford. So I suppose my my question to you is, I know Suhaim, um, you've 
boycotted certain events and so has Loki, I don't know, Fessel, if you have as well, in terms of funding and where associations you have become known to you that this is this is connected to um, a sort of surveillance led project of, let's say, prevent. Um, would that always remain your stance or would you just to play devil's advocate and to ask you, would you consider going to that kind of forum and saying, OK, I'll sit down and I'll have a dialogue and I'll give you my perspective, knowing what I do? Or do you feel it's more powerful to to sort of do the boycott and why? Yeah. So, I mean, so this is a question that obviously came up at the time. So in 2019, for people who don't know, um, there, was a, there was a festival that occurs every year in Bradford, Bradford Literature Festival. Um, and I was supposed to be performing and uh, taking part in a few events. And then I found out that they had taken some counter extremism funding. As I said, my family's from Bradford. I'm very aware of the over policing that Bradford has faced since the 2001 riots, arguably since the 1980s, arguably since the 1960s. Um, and so I, know, I was just concerned at why, why that would be the case. Um, and so I spoke, as you mentioned, I spoke to the organizers. So I had a really, we had a lovely conversation. And in the conversation, I was disappointed to find out that, you know, they didn't see it to be an issue in the way that I saw it. And so the reason, so it's an interesting question because the reason for the, me withdrawing from that was that I was unwilling to say that I concede to a situation in which the state believes that it can fund arts and literature and that we have to be, be complicit in that and we have to attend. And so I think this notion that like, would you go and would you have the dialogue is sort of, to me, counterproductive because I'm I'm not worried about the I'm not worried about the festival I'm not worried about dialogue I'm worried about the state and why it is funding arts and literature and so going to the event and having that conversation I mean it, it's it doesn't under it doesn't undo the fundamental kind of issue at the heart of this which is why is counter extremism got anything to do with arts and literature and you know, it's also part of the fact that the more we normalize this, the more we take this kind of funding, we actually play into this idea that, you know, there is demand for it, right? So demand and supply, you know, say, I think somebody told me a story at the time about, um, say there was like a, 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 a bouncy ball that's being sold and it has like something on it that you, you really disagree with the writing on it, right? And you're like, whatever the thing says on it. So as a result, you buy up all of the balls to, to stop anybody else getting them. But what, what the supplier, all the supplier sees is that all the balls have been sold, right? So they're just gonna keep making more, producing more, and there's, there is demand for this. And so that analogy I find useful because I think this argument that let's just take the funding and let's just do, you know, let's just do our own things with it. Let's like create our own spaces is, is not, is, it's actually creating, it's actually playing right into the normalization. And so I, what's interesting is when I boycott, when I withdrew and when other people began to withdraw, including Loki, it, really was fascinating to me the way the, the the speed with which the boycott itself became problematized so that was actually the more problematic thing than the counter extremism funding from the state and actually um civitas one of these like neoconservative think tanks has written a report in which the boycott is mentioned as proof of the intimidation that muslims face in taking counter extremism funding and working with the state and so it's fascinating that i i, I you know on the one hand it's like yo you know you're this kind of you know, some of the, I'm just talking about some of the narrative at the time, it was like this egotistical boycott, this um, kind of self-absorbed, self-indulgent boycott. And on the other hand, you're intimidating, you know, Muslim women who just are trying to, to, to aid their community with literature and with arts. And the fact of the matter is, my concern is the state. And what disappeared in the conversation? The state. What disappeared in the conversation? The policing of Muslims, the surveillance, uh, racialized, militarized, you know, global industry that gets to be a beneficiary of it. So, it's, yeah, another thing that's fascinating as well is that I think there were people, multiple people, you know, uh, one of these journalists who wrote an article in The Guardian about how, you know, she was somebody who formerly had been like, oh, I love your poetry, Sahima. And as soon as I actually acted on the principles of that poetry, it's like, no, we don't want, we don't need to actually do it. And that's an interesting point because I think that it's also about the things that we're saying, if we truly believe them, you know, that this is i don't know i think sometimes when we talk about art it can sound like abstraction can talk about as it can sound as if we're talking about something separate to ourselves um and for me that that withdrawal is something i would i would do it every time i would do you know I, and i i have a policy that i would never work with any 
um, organization that takes home office funding in general. You know, I don't want to be complicit in a hostile environment. I want to be complicit in any form of policing. And maybe perhaps that is a stance that I can take. And I think that, that you know, the more, I kind of feel like I have more responsibility the, the bigger a platform I get and the more kind of social capital I have because these are decisions that other people can't take, right? Like a school child or a teacher can't opt out of prevent. Somebody who is, you know, um, working in a hospital, well, I mean, they say, I mean, we should urge them to and they should, but like legislatively, there's a much different kind of pressure on them. Someone like me, all I can do is either make art or withdraw it. All I can do is that. And I think in that situation, the most powerful thing I could do, and, and I, as I say, I would do again, is withdrawing the only thing that I was being invited on the basis of. And so, yeah, in a nutshell, I think, you know, these are serious questions and they demand serious answers. And the point also of that withdrawal was that it created a space for the community to then have a conversation about what does security look like on our terms? What does safety look like for us? So we had the alternative Bradford Literature Festival, you know, it was trade unions, student unions, youth clubs, like a, a ton of people. Um, and they got to have that conversation. So, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, you've got to put your money where your mouth is, right? You can't just write poems about how bad the, the state is and, and then kind of be complicit in its violence when, when the opportunity arises. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Suhaima, for being so open and I think really um, getting to the heart of how um, one can get represented as woke and what it meant to you in terms of your practice and your art. Um, I know that Loki has to go and I'm also conscious that I've gone a bit more over time than I promised I would at the start. There are some questions in the Q&A box so um, I'll just read them out and um, while before I do that Loki was there anything you wanted to add to what's been said so that you can have your last word before you slip off while we're sort of taking the questions? Well for the last word I would say that it seems to me that in the name of freedom of speech we are seeing several mechanisms entrenched within the society to squash that freedom of speech. We are seeing a deflection onto a kind of uh, manifestation of no platforming that has been a known anti-fascist practice across the uh, last several decades now is being depicted as something new and representative of this thing, this big scary thing that's coming to get you called cancel culture. We know that nobody who supposedly who is called woke refers to themselves as woke and nobody who supposedly um, partakes in cancel culture actively says I partake in cancel culture so what it's what it's a way of doing is depicting the real censorship which has always come from the state as completely invisible and non-existent and rendering people power largely centered around students and maybe people saying things to you which you don't like on Twitter and sort of interrupting a general quiet ambience and tranquility of life in the commentariat, that that is somehow the real censorship that we face today in society. And as so often as these things go, they might tap right, but they always smash left. And so that means that if you are a person who cares about social justice, who believes in a distribution, a greater distribution of power and, um, uh, and, and political subjectivity in this society, that you will be likely to suffer from this stuff. And when we live in a time where algorithmically we have a huge imbalance of um, information and data, so we are all of us plugged into companies who do experiments on us every day algorithmically, but also are absorbing loads of different aspects of data about us in order to then sell that information to companies to more efficiently advertise to us, but then also work out ways to make us feel things. So in that period, in that kind of time that we are in, we have to really increase our criticality when dealing with these kind of platforms. We can't still cling to this thing that was very widespread around the Arab Spring, that the um, that political activity and mobilization combined 
with big tech companies would lead us to the utopia of um, greater um, equality and understanding. Quite the opposite is true. Those companies are um, increasingly entrenched with the existing um, dictatorship or prevailing orthodoxies of our time and will sometimes use um, free speech as a subterfuge to push forward these kind of uh, these kind of things, especially within the academy, as you all will know better than me for sure. But I'm so sorry to uh, leave so early. I would love to stay and enjoy what everyone else is stay saying. I hope everyone else will stay and enjoy what uh, everyone has to say. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and stay safe and stay well. Thank you. And we hope to reconnect with you. You too. For now. For the best. Um, Bye -bye. Okay. So I will now read out the questions in the Q&A and Zuhaima and Faisal, if you are happy to um, listen to them and then take them um, in whichever order you would like to. So the first question is from Fatima Alaraka, who says, I'm a third year fine art student at uni about to graduate in a week and uh, good luck Fatima. And I'm really questioning my intentions for being in the art uh, world outside of education. I'd like to ask how, as Muslims, how do we best keep our intentions sincere whilst using our image voice art to interact with a wider audience? Because like in the book, I refuse to condemn both Suhaima and Loki talk about the politics of performativity and how they are often expected to perform in a certain way would being anonymous creative work. So um, that's the first question. And there's a question from Zamina Rahmatullah. Um, and apologies for if I mispronounce your name, I'm just kind of going with the what I see. How does one find their most impactful form of art? Is this about exploration of all forms? Um, Hassan uh, Voda, the next person asks, uh, well, says, Alhamdulillah, always grateful for spaces that speak to anti-oppressive practice, creativity and Islam. And that's a comment. The question is, have you come across any Muslim run creative cultural spaces in the UK that are well resourced? So funding from within the community that do not have to rely on state resources, perhaps more pertinent in visual arts. But do you feel art spaces are tied to a confidence in a particular meaning of secular liberalism that excludes. A uh, question from Zuhaib uh, Ali, could any of the panelists perhaps speak on the notion of art produced in syncretic and co-harmonious settings? Is such artistic and cultural production not paramount in the face of contemporary domestic and social fragmentation? And is the artist, artistic sphere doing enough to foster these kinds of spaces? So I think Zuhaib is asking about coexistence, um, if, if I've kind of understood that rightly. Um, um, I don't read Nagri, so I can't say the name, but do you pay attention to the narrative form narrative from, from organizations that claim to represent Muslims to Britain? How does their comms make you feel? How, when do you choose to respond? And how does this dynamic inform your expression artistry? Karen Birch says, an hour is never enough. Can you all do a part two? I'll sign up in a heartbeat from Los Angeles, California. Thank you, Karen Birch, for that vote of confidence. Hannah GK, so here's the question for Sohema. As a young Muslim girl growing up in Leeds, how would you go about breaking out of this political docility and the stigma around engaging in political conversations without being confined to a narrative? So, um, Shall I, uh, Faisal, shall we start with you and then go to Sahema um, for the responses? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll try. Um, so I think the first one really, the first question really around advice, uh, intention uh, and anonymity. Um, from my perspective, my advice, uh, and this kind of covers the, the second question as well, is that you have to keep creating. You have to keep making, keep making, keep making, keep making. That's the most important thing. And if um, you have, well, it will come naturally. It is something that you 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 should feel that you have to do. Um, so that is the first thing. And that's something that is really hard after 
um, I think doing a degree, you're talking to someone who finished their degree though in 99. So it's been a while uh, and it took me a long time to get, uh, to, to grab the rope again. I had to kind of lose it a few times. You lose your mojo, but then you get back on it and, um, uh, and you just come back stronger. Each knockdown uh, means that you come back stronger. You, you know, you let go of the skin and you, you re, you know, you reanimate. Um, the other question to do in terms of what you do, um, you know, there's a long list of different things and um, ways that you can keep yourself, I suppose, still within the arts. So it's about looking at people that you really admire um, and reaching out to organisations that are doing the kinds of things that you like uh, and really researching them so that you, you know, kind of feel comfortable within those organizations. Um, but then that comes to really the third question, which is to do with, are there any 100%, you know, kind of cultural spaces that are bereft of funding? So I, I don't know if there are, I don't think there are. I, uh, what I have done is that I develop work that didn't require those spaces. Um, that's why I do a lot of shop signs. That's why I normally do smiling come uncle up guess and he I'd normally do that kind of this is what I'm talking about. What do you reckon? I'll pay your electricity bill for a month and I'll be able to advertise and do the work that I need or shop for so there are there are ways and means of being able to engage with people to kind of show your work. Um not that I'm saying that you know that worked for me, but then there are other there are other ways of doing, uh, or, or especially online now in terms of uh, doing stuff yourself and showing work online. Um, so uh, I've forgotten the fourth question. Um, do, 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 do. The narrative of organisations. Um, I think it was that. Yeah, it was. It was in terms of dealing with the narrative of what certain arts organizations or organizations do that is subjective it's very much to do with you know i i've been eaten up and spat out by a number of organizations in the past and before this exhibition was initially created in 2017 five years later it's arrived at the brunei gallery so that should give you an indication of some of the processes and some of the hurdles that potentially can come about through trying to get this work out there um, but like I've said uh, initially, there are um, there there are colleagues, and there is solidarity with the with with people, and especially uh, if you are courageous about reaching out. Then I think, uh, from my experience, because I am I'm awful at this as well. Um, from my experience, for a hundred that you put out there, people you'll find some diamonds, uh, and those diamonds who will agree with you on a spiritual level, on a artistic level and and they will they will catalyze you know they will catalyze your uh your abilities in a way thanks thanks vessel um so Haima, there's one more uh comment that's coming for you that i'm just going to read and you don't have to answer it just now but just so that it's in your bank are you interested or have the time to organize a monthly workshop that invites poets to create and share as a poet it's been hard to find a muslim anti-racist creative space Okay. <laughs> okay. Love this. Uh, I love this way of doing Q and A. Actually, it's quite funny. Um, so, I just wanted to address. Yeah, the question about um, intentions. Um, I think. I think that and this is something that I think about all the time. So, I mean, feel free to email me, um, Fatima. Um, but I think really that your your concerns about intentions and our intentions in the world is like going to be a lifelong struggle. Um, as in, I. I think like without making this into like <laughs> me trying to give a khutbah, I think what you have to remember is that, you know, anything that you do with an audience or with people it, surrounding you, like right now, or in your home or wherever there are people, I think you're always gonna have to question whether you're doing it because you want praise, because you want to be seen to be good, to be funny, to be interesting, to be clever, or because, you know, you actually believe that this is worthwhile and has a, and, and fulfills a purpose that you believe that you're, here for and I don't think that anonymity might work that might be the way but I think that you're still going to face the same issues right because you still want your art to be responsive to certain things you still want people to to speak to it and etc so I think 
in the time that we're living in and in terms of like the ways that we're forced to perform anyway, like perform our identities, perform our goodness, our whatever it is, the different gazes that are, are upon us. Um, I would just say maybe <laughs> embrace, embrace this as a lifelong um, struggle and all you can do is your best. That is what I would say is all you can do is your best and kind of embrace the mistakes that you make and be willing to try to have the humility to kind of own up to them. And, and I think also, you know, being open to the fact that we're growing and we're all growing and hopefully we'll do better as we go along. But um, yeah, I don't know that the, the, the public space is, that for, is sort of forgiving enough for that, but that, that's be my personal advice. Um, in terms of form of art, uh, I don't know. I, I think I think definitely just try it, try stuff. If you have an interest in something, if you think, oh, wow, calligraphy looks awesome, just give it a try. If you have, if you think, oh, you know, I'd love to do spoken word poetry. I mean, I had, I honestly, six, seven years ago, if you said to me, oh, you know, you'll be speaking on this panel about the fact that you're, you're a poet, I'd just be like, that's completely ridiculous. I have no interest in poetry. And the truth is I used to watch loads of slam poetry on YouTube and I thought it was awesome. I thought it was so cool. Um, and I didn't ever at any point think, oh, that's something I would like to do. It was just something that I thought was really cool. Um, and it was only when somebody sort of said to me, oh, what's something that you would really love to try, but you just don't think that you could do that I said aloud for the first time, oh, I'd love to try, you know, spoken word poetry. Um, and, you know, and then here, here, here I am and people think that that's a real thing that I do. So I think you know, try things out and, and yeah, see, see where you end up. Um, I think there are some Muslim run creative spaces that are not well resourced, but are like community funded. And I think they tend to be, they've always tended to be like very small and very local. And it's only kind of when I've been invited to them that I know that they exist. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think what would be exciting is if, you know, mosques become those spaces, right? If we can like make the mosque a space again, where it's like actually a, cult a cultural hub of production. And think about the fact that, you know, many of the early companions of the Prophet Sallallahu were poets and they, they, that, this was like very much part and parcel of their lifestyle. But um, yeah, I think in the conditions of counter extremism that we live in, I don't know how could you say that is, but I, the best, the most fun I've had doing poetry workshops was when it was just like in a local mosque, the complete mishmash of kids and adults and just like going for it. And I think it was because of the freedom of knowing that there's no strings attached to this, number one, and there's no, um, there's like no funding outputs, right? It's not like an art council thing. It's just, it's just like people want to, to write. Um, which actually I'll just jump to the last question. Yeah, I would definitely love to do something like that about um, workshops and creative spaces. I think I'm just really like my brain dead by Zoom. So I think I've been kind of hoping <laughs> this zoom lifestyle will end but allahu alam so we'll see with that um but yeah feel free to drop me an email if that's something you feel i could help with and sorry i'm just looking if there's anything else that i feel i can answer um in terms of yeah art produced in syncretic and co-harmonious settings i think that is ha i do i think that does happen quite often and but i have to be honest i think it usually is not very radical like the art that i this is very this is very subjective to what i have seen um, I think when those opportunities have emerged, it sometimes feels that, yeah, I think, I think the question I would have to ask is like, what, okay, what are we trying to produce and why? Like, what, what's the goal of this? Um, and that actually goes to the final answer I wanted to give, which was to Hannah um, about growing up in Leeds, um, not about growing up in Leeds, but about how to uh, engage with these questions and, and things. And my, the only answer I could give, because I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in this too. I'm also trying to um, grow and learn. I think the number one thing is just ask questions. Don't accept anything to be, you know, inherently true or unquestionable. Uh, and I think that's that is exciting because it can underpin any exciting work that you produce. You know, your work, whether it's writing, whether it's a visual, whatever it is, can be full of those questions, and they will always speak to people because we all have questions and we don't necessarily ask them. But also, I think that political political dis docility. Um, is really just the result of being told that there are no questions that need to be asked because everything is as it should be and we don't need to have any questions about it and i think the more questions that we ask the more we begin to kind of you know liberate ourselves from certain narratives and to ask really why are we even invested in some of those narratives ourselves because you'll find that we are we're very invested in some narratives that don't don't serve us um so yeah i would just say ask questions and you know read books and don't believe all the books that you read as well <laughs> i think a healthy healthy mix of questioning and cynicism um but yeah that's that's all from me <laughs>
thank you. Thank you both. You've been um, amazing in taking all those questions and going through them. Sorry to bunch them up or, or all up in, in the end like this, but we're just sort of the time factor is, is upon us. Uh, there's been this has been such a rich session. It feels like it's the beginning of a conversation rather than the ending. Thank you, Vessel, for sort of curating it, getting us all together. Thank you, Sohema, for giving up your time to be here. Thank you to Lucy Koza in the Brunei Gallery for all the logistical and admin support that she's kindly given us, to John Hollingworth and um, to all you know people institutionally who've been supporting this. Um, Bessel, I hope the exhibition is something that will really open up community spaces for if, I mean, beyond the pandemic and post pan, uh, if we can get to uh, the non-Zoom lifestyle, as um, Sahema said, that, that will be something to look forward to. And I think critical thinking, integrity, those are the things that really speak to me from the work that you do and doing that in spite of challenges and um, lots of kinds of things that you've talked about and explained and confronted. So you are, um, you know, your activism is very much there in, in what you've said and it's been wonderful to hear about it and to learn about it. So wishing you both a lot of success going forward with the things that you do and um looking forward to many more conversations thank you thank you to you thank you to you as well amna uh and from me as well thank you to lucy but thank you very much to uh Saima and to loki for for agreeing to attend it's been a, a real pleasure thank you thank, thank you everyone it's goodbye from us and uh we hope to see you at our next event bye for now bye